This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. A stunningly beautiful um, introduction, and a, a very warm one, and a scary one for two reasons, of course. One is that in this award-winning teachers series, you immediately one is faced with, the, with the, the, the fear that there's going to be absolutely no evidence whatsoever in the, in the, in the next hour of like why one is award winning. And so that's, that's quite scary. And furthermore, I even, it's, so it's even with more regret that I have to, in, in the, in, for purposes of full disclosure, share with you this headline about me from the Palo Alto Daily News. This is from Tuesday. It says, teacher is put on leave after scuffle. <laughs> a, lo a longtime college professor was placed on leave following a scuffle and fist fight with a student in front of a full classroom last week, college officials confirmed yesterday, etc. Actually, no, this is about a foothill college professor. <laughs> um, but my teaching assistants um, brought that in and thought that um, I should take some sort of credit slash blame for that. Um, that will not be one of the suggested um, teaching comportments <laughs> in this presentation. Should I do? <laughs> no. Um, aside from that, um, uh, uh, well, not apocryphal story, but one that actually can't be um, truly attributed to me, um, I would like to tell you four stories that do, in, that, that, that do or did involve me. So first of all, th the first story I want to tell you is, is about me and particularly about a former Stanford student, uh, a graduate of Stanford in the philosophy program, whose dissertation intersected with some of the research I was doing in music, and so I was uh, working on an independent study with him. He then went on to uh, his first tenure track teaching position at Virginia Tech University. And um, he's he was teaching a formal logic class there this year. This was his first year, first teaching, you know, real sort of uh, a teaching experience where he was responsible for a full course. And he was teaching this formal logic class, this undergraduate class. And he called me after, I believe, the third lecture. And he was quite frantic and quite worried. And it's because he had had this terrible, terrible experience and he wanted some advice about what he could do to extricate himself from this position that he had found himself in, which is that he was explaining a formal logic problem on the board. And he had made an error. And not only had he made an error, he continued for three or four minutes building on this error on the blackboard before a student rightfully pointed out that you know, he had made this, this mistake. And the student pointed out politely. But of course, my friend, who is, who is in fact brilliant and who knows this stuff left and right, you know, was absolutely mortified. And he thought that his authority and his legitimacy and dignity was completely undermined by this experience. He'd never be able to recover from it, and his career was going down the drain. And, um, and, and he said, you know, he asked, what can I do? And so I told him, I gave him three, I kind of oriented him to three ideas. One is that I suggested that he admit his shortcomings and his fallibility, because we all are fallible. And actually, it's not the students who expect us to be perfect. It's, it's really the teachers who expect uh, that of themselves. And so, um, and 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 also to try and to recognize the fact that in a, in a, in, a, in I think the best university situation, learning is a, is a two-way street, and that we have a lot to learn from our students, and we should celebrate when somebody can point out that something went wrong. The second thing is I thought humor is always appropriate, um, and uh, and I, expl I I mentioned to him something that I do on the first day of class, which is I tell students um, who who often wonder about this independently of any kind of fallibility issues, what. I would like to be called. And I tell them I like to be called Mark. If you have a problem with that, feel free to call me Professor Applebaum. But there is one case in which I prefer to be called Dr. Applebaum. And that's when you raise your hand to correct me because I've done something so grossly incompetent or I've spelled something incorrectly on the blackboard, you know, that you have that teacher blackboard myopia thing that happens to you, and, you know, or anything like that. And so basically what it will do is it will alert me to the fact that there is this criticism coming, this constructive criticism coming, and it will cushion the blow by reminding me that I have this terminal degree. And, <clears throat> And they kind of think that's funny, and it's a way of bringing up this, this kind of fallibility issue. And then lastly, I pointed out that, that, that I reminded him that, in, in, at least in my opinion, there is tremendous edu educational value in failures. So we, we learn very little from getting things right. We learn quite a bit, however, from getting things wrong, looking back at that, scrutinizing what went wrong, re retracing our steps cognitively, and finding out where we, you know, we, we, went, um, we went awry. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with you being, in a sense, the, um, the, the victim or the, um, the, the subject in that case, where a student is helping you retrace your footsteps. 
And that seemed to help him a lot. And he tried it. Uh, he tried all these things the next day, and he felt like he had just regained. It, it, it had blasted him forward in the cachet uh, meter with his students, and 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 all was well. So that's. That was a bit more verbose than I had hoped. Let me move on to the second of these four introductory stories. And that was about a colleague who also needed my help. This is a colleague at Stanford who had a particularly precocious student who was answering all the questions immediately, monopolizing the entire conversation, whose thinking, whose experience was well beyond that of this student's peers. And, but it was creating a, a clearly a, um, a, an a less than ideal environment for the other students who were not able to get in on this conversation and who were you know, not able to participate. And so he, he wondered, what can I do about this? And I said, well, I had an experience like this actually at Stanford a few years back. And what I did is I took the student aside privately and I said, and, and, I, and I wanted to express two things. First of all, I wanted to let the student know, give the student a sense of security, that that student didn't have to prove himself to me anymore, that their, their participation grade was for sure not in jeopardy, and, that, and I was very impressed with their intellect and their experience, and, and, I, and I welcome uh, outside of class office hour uh, conversations about the more esoteric things that were maybe not quite as central to the, to the, to the, to the, to the conversation. Um, and then the second thing was that I asked him if he could help me in a sense teach the class, to, to kind of bring him onto the team and explain to him that it's my goal as a teacher to give everybody a chance, a chan uh, everyone in the class a chance to, to speak and to contribute. And he would be helping me by, by having this extraordinary restraint, by waiting at least an extra 10 seconds to see if, and then if nobody else had anything to say, then he could jump in. And the, both of those seemed to work. So I felt really gratified that I was able to help this other colleague. The third story is, and fourth stories are about uh, about my needs, about help that I needed. So I had a student when I was teaching at Mississippi State University who asked to turn in an assignment late. And I, and I told her no, she could not turn in the assignment late. And she was very upset. I mean, she was particularly irate. And I felt like, well, why are you so upset? I mean, I was, you've, in my mind, I didn't say this to her, but in my mind, the reason that my verdict was no, you can't turn in this late is because you've abused my goodwill because I've said yes two times prior. And this was the third time in a row. And come on, let's, let's, let's get on with it. And, and let's be professional here and responsible and take deadlines seriously for once. And I asked a colleague of mine, because I was, I was really disturbed by the degree to which she was upset. And he said, your expectations are not clear. And, and what she, you, you realized that she had, she had you know, burned enough goodwill. But in her mind, there was no way to predict when you could bestow this extra you know, little favor or this sort of like, you know, to make this sort of pardon, and 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 when and and when it, you know when she actually had to abide by the rules because the rules were not in fact clear. And he said, if you make the rules clear at the beginning, you'll have no problems. And he was absolutely right. And it turns out the rules usually don't matter as long as they're made clear. They they could be arbitrary. Please don't make arbitrary rules. I mean, <laughs> base them on some sort of you know values that that are reflective. But like I mean, so I could have had um, no papers will be uh, will ever be uh, accepted late. Papers will be accepted late always, um, or like <laughs> students may have one coupon during the quarter during which they can turn in one late assignment, or whatever. Any of those things would have been clear. But she was, in a sense, I had, in, I had created a kind of infantilizing situation where she just went to the, the, you know, the, the, her, like, the, 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 the teacher, the person who's in charge, and just had to like, ask for something and not know, you know when it was going to happen when it w wouldn't. So that was very useful advice that I got from my colleague. Another time I had useful advice from a colleague was when I was teaching at Carleton College. And there were some students who were having some trouble with some of the course materials. And I noticed that they weren't really coming. I would invite them to my office hours, but they, really, they often wouldn't come. And I was I wondered about how to improve the situation. And I learned a great tip from a colleague at Carleton College. And this, of course, doesn't work in huge classes, but in, in modest or in you know, enrollment, classes of modest enrollment. What I do now is I have, a particular, this particularly is important in freshman seminars, I have a, an, a kind of office, office chat sign up list where for five or 10 minutes, students have to sign up during the first or at the latest second week. And they have to visit with me for a little office chat, a get to know each other chat. And it has nothing to do with the course content unless they, and it certainly has nothing to do with them hopefully falling behind or having problems at that point in the course. But it's a chance just to get to know each other, learn something about my students, be very informal. But what it's doing secretly is it's introducing students to my office. They, have a, they, they, they take away a mental picture of, oh, that's the place where I go to get help. That's what an office hour might look like. That's the safe place where I can, I can, uh, I can work on these things. And, and 
what's extraordinary is it really actually works. It, 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 it dramatically improves the number of students who will actually come to you for some, for some help. Now, these are four stories, two of which involved my getting help from uh, colleagues and, and two, the first two stories where I was able to offer some help. What do they have in common? They have almost nothing in common. And they are a grab bag collection of wisdom. Some where I, I sort of feel like I could take certain credit for generating it, and others where I sort of accumulated it from, from, from colleagues. It's been my experience when I come to these talks and others, great talks sponsored by the Center for Teaching and Learning, that I take a, I, the, the, the majority of it isn't, I'm not ready to hear, or it doesn't actually make sense to me, or I'm not able to somehow calibrate my teaching to, 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 to apply those things. But in every single one of those sessions, I've taken away one, two, sometimes five things, which is a minority of what was said. But those are gems, and that's the reason you come to these things. You pick up things that you can use and things that you can uh, apply in your own way. And I really believe that teaching is a cottage industry. There's no one way of doing it. We all do it in different ways. And so what I hope this grab bag does is it's a little bit of a teaser to um, set up the, the, the bulk of today's presentation, which is this maybe incoherent, um, but this diverse Salma Gundy, this grab bag of different observations that I've made about that are based on my experiences in the classrooms. And if you take away one or two or hopefully five of these things and in some way be, are able to apply it to your own teaching or your own needs, then it will be um, a, a great success. So um, there won't be a clear philosophical argument. There will not be a synthesis of ideas. There will, there, I don't think there will be a conclusion. Um, I, instead, I will just run out of time. Um, so it's, this is a, I, I just, I just want to make it clear that this is kind of a thing that's in list form. Before I jump into this, I should tell you two things. One is that the, uh, uh, the, the form of this list will, be in the, the, will follow the, the title of the talk. So we have, um, as a kind of sandwich, these four things with number one is things I do but shouldn't do, and number four is things I don't do but should do. So that's the kind of like the exterior of the sandwich, which is a sort of falling on my sword, self-deprecating moment, and then uh, this kind of confessional thing. And then in the center are the things I do and should do and things I don't do and shouldn't do, which are this more like narcissistic, self-congratulatory mode, I think. Um, and, um, and, and so that's, so that, that's sort of the, the, and the form will be to follow that and time permitting, I w th uh, those will be self-generated ideas that will follow that form. And time permitting, we'll do it again, but then we'll look at the responses to a poll that I gave last week to my rock, sex, and rebellion class um, about the, to help me prepare for this. Um, again, this two-way street thing, right? And, uh, and so I, I can share with you some of their responses. So first it'll be like th what I think I'm doing and then like probably what I'm really doing. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the last, the last little digression before I launch into this list is to just uh, uh, m mention uh, something about my teaching experience, um, and that is that uh, Carleton College is a small liberal arts school environment, and I learned quite a bit about, as a student there and as a teacher there, uh, maybe the most, of the, the, the most important things that inform my teaching here. Stanford is, uh, well, we don't need to talk about Stanford. But I can tell you that you know the University of California at San Diego is uh, a research institution, but unlike Stanford, it's a public one. And Mississippi State University is a public institution, but it's a land-grant institution. And what was particularly uh, interesting and often uh, vexing or challenging to teach there is that unlike Stanford and even UCSD, you had a tremendously large number of first-generation college students which changes a, a little bit the, the, the demographic and how one needs to teach. And you also have uh, a classroom with um, greater diversity in terms of uh, kind of academic preparation. So that you have this, uh, uh, and I think actually that's one of the most troublesome things in a, in a to, is where, how to pitch a class when you have a, di a diverse class. In some ways, Stanford makes things a little bit, quite a bit easier. Um, and, the sec and the last bit about my background is to mention that I, I actually teach in if the music department could be said to be to consist of five areas, I actually teach in all of them, which is really gratifying for me. So I teach composition on both the graduate and undergraduate level. I teach music theory, um, uh, undergraduate music theory. I te teach an electronic music course at, at Karma called uh, Musique Concrete in the Digital Era, which is a course that I invented. And then I teach three other courses in music history, which I also invented to our freshman seminars. One of them is called Art versus Pop, which is a critique and examination of the highbrow lowbrow paradigm. And the second was a seminar on the music and philosophy of John Cage, 
and then this course, Rock, Sex, and Rebellion, which I'm teaching now, which is quite unusual for me in that there are, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a not, it's for non-majors. There are no prerequisites. It satisfies both the arts and the American history GERs. It's got rock, sex, and rebellion in the title, and there are 200 students who come to it. So it's like, so that's a very different kind of um, space for me. And then finally, in music, we have performance, and I'm the director of SICK, which is the Stanford Improvisation Collective, which is a, a well, it's a more of a workshop and laboratory environment. Launching right in now, I'll take a breath. I don't know if you need one. I'll take a breath. And I'll launch into things that I do but shouldn't do. So the first thing that I do that I shouldn't do is I'm overly ambitious in terms of the, the content of my, my curricula. I try to jam pack way too much in. And it's not good teaching, I don't think. I think, it, I think there's, I mean, you can still do some, you can salvage those courses. But, but sometimes it really, or you, you you, there, are cha there are special challenges you set up for yourself when you actually try to do too much. And I attribute this to being uh, a little bit to, to being a young, well, not so much anymore, but a relatively young teacher. And, also, and, and part of that youth, I think, is like this excitement about the sense of like, I've learned and been enriched by all of these things. And it would be this crime to not wedge all of that information at, in one moment into the you know, minds and hearts of all these students. They'll, their lives will be totally impoverished if I don't <laughs> it, it, you know, expose them to every single thing and get them to do all the great things that, that, that I had uh, opportunity to do in the past. Um, so that's a, that's a constant challenge. I'm getting better at it. But I, I still think there's not a course that I teach that doesn't fail a little bit in that regard. You will notice that this talk will model that perfectly. Um, a second thing that I, I'm, I'm also better at, but I, but I sometimes fail at, it's something I do but I shouldn't do, um, I sometimes think about projects first when I, design, when I design my classes. I think about those cool paper topics and those projects and those collaborative teamwork things. And I think about field trips. And I think about cool examples in lectures and stuff like that. And, and I think we're almost all of us are guilty of this uh, at some point or another. The correct order is to first determine the goals of the course. And we think that by deciding what the paper topic is, we've decided on a goal. But we haven't. That's not the goal. Of the goal of the course, well, it could be. But uh, usually it's not. The goal of the course is not like, let's have it. There's going to be a paper. Um, and and uh, the second thing to do is then to determine what assessment measures will tell you if, this, if these goals are being accomplished. And the third and last thing to do is to decide, then fill in what are the various projects and things you're going to do. But I get so excited about the projects. I can't help it. And so I, miss, I, some, I still fail sometimes when I'm designing a course where I think like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, like it, it's about these projects we're going to do. And it's not. Um, a third thing that I do that I shouldn't do is I agonize over the one problem student. And I, I always forget that negative feedback is, is, is really distorting. And you forget about it. And, and I don't know if you've had this experience. For those of you who are teachers, you're sitting in a room, and you, know, you have this one student who you know is disgruntled, upset about some issue or another. And it's almost like, and that person could be sitting, I'm not picking you in particular, that person could be sitting there. And it's like, it's almost like your field of, it's like this thing over there. I mean, it's just like, it's this magnetic thing that is just like so disruptive. It's not even, you know, that was probably an unfair thing to do. You probably feel quite uncomfortable now. I didn't mean to do that. But the person, the point is, it's not, it's, not, it's not a question of where that person is physically located, but it's like all you see. And then you start second guessing yourself, and you start apologizing or, or, or being defensive to that one person or that one interest, as it were. Um, so that's something that, 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 I, that I have a problem with. Another thing that I do and I probably shouldn't do is, is I perform. Um, and maybe this comes from my musical background. So to a certain extent, I see teaching as a kind of performance. And I get a certain kind of ego gratification about that. And I, I think there's a healthy side to this, but I, I, I just get like nervous about it. Like, am I, you know, so I, that's sort of a, something that I think needs to stay in check. Um, so let's move to the middle of the sandwich, which will be longer. <laughs> um, things that I do and should do. Um, one of the things that I do that I really believe in is I use any course as a, a kind of a, a mechanism to leverage deeper insights and, have, and to have other experiences that go beyond the nominal content of the course. To be honest, I, I mean, 
I get interested in content and I feel responsible about certain kinds of content, but ultimately that's not what I'm interested in, I think, as a teacher. I'm interested in something that I, I feel is somehow deeper or more valuable. And, and it only takes that sort of like, you know, that disheartening statistic, I don't even know what it is, about what percentage of factoids students retain and so forth. So I realize there's got to be something that's deeper that students are actually taking away from it. And one of the things that, <coughs> excuse me, is important in all my classes is that students uncover particular personal biases and that they, uh, the, and, and, the, and they kind of have a sense of how to position themselves in a larger, more global sense of culture. And one of the, th I'll give you an example of an exercise that I do in music theory. So students come in one day, and I, and, and I put them into various groups. So two students go to blackboards, and they have to draw a, a house and a sun and a tree, uh, just do a picture of those. And then, this, this sounds so juvenile, I realize, but, it, but you'll see where I'm going eventually. And then another group of students have to um, make a list of what foods should be on a Thanksgiving menu, dinner menu. And another group of students have to make all the words they can out of the, uh, the letters in Stanford. And then another group of students have to decide what, um, they have to make a, compile a list of, of tools that they might like to have if they're going to fix a bicycle. And then, and then another group of students, I, I, I ask them, um, what should I wear to, I'm going to a wedding, what should I wear, what would be appropriate? And so they do this, and we spend five minutes on this. And then I say, okay, let's do this again. Okay, but now the sun, the moon, the sun, the, the sun and the tree and the house are on an alien planet. And you have to make words out of Stanford, the letters in Stanford, but they have to be in Danish. And the wedding that I'm going to is in Borneo. And instead of a, a fixing a bicycle, I actually need you to, to list the things that you need for open heart surgery. And, and, and it's going to happen. And the only tools we're going to have are the ones you come up with for that list. So it's, there's kind of a certain serious requirement here. And, um, and it's not a Thanksgiving menu. It's breaking of the, of the fast um, if for Ramadan. And, and so anyway, the point, there are, there are certain people there who are pre-med and who get the I don't know if they get it right, the, the heart surgery thing, but maybe they do. And, and obviously you'll have, you'll have Islamic students and so forth, and maybe somebody from, I haven't had anyone from Borneo yet. But the point is that suddenly when they, when they recognize that they're not, they don't participate, you know, in general, um, in these, in the, when you participate in a certain culture, your answers and your responses are going to be very rich and, and efficacious. And when you don't, then you're, 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 you know, you have this uneasy, uh, footing where you're not quite sure and you, you have uh, you know less to draw upon and all of this is actually a way to introduce this thing this kind of dreaded thing in music theory called figured bass which is this now arcane baroque era 17th century kind of code where there's a bunch of hermetic symbols on a page and a player would look at those things and they would know what notes to play. It's not a standard notation. I apologize to those of you who are in music who would prefer a richer and more elaborate um, uh, explanation of figured bass. But, but what I'm trying to say is that there is this thing, and this is what I'm saying to the students, that makes a lot of sense if you are from the 17th century or you have studied this tradition and you have, uh, you have, you have, you know, enriched, you know, you have a, a rich perspective because you've immersed yourself in this thing and you've taken the time, the discipline to learn about this kind of, this, this thing. And from that, you can make decisions that are not just the agonized student decisions like how do I get it right for my homework assignment, but this decision is not only right, it's witty. Or this decision is right, but it's heretical. Or this decision is right, but it has, um, it references something else, right? There's no basis to make those kinds of decisions when you don't participate in a culture. You wouldn't know if, like, this particular hat in Borneo is like, oh, well, the, he's, that's a real statement, because that's a funeral hat or something. I mean, how do you, like, how do you, how do you make those kinds of cultural distinctions? And so the point is, I, to me, ultimately, it's more, I want the students to, to have a certain kind of facility with figured base at the end of the class, and they do. But it's actually more important to me that they take away this archetype of understanding this idea about participating in a culture. Do you see what I mean? So that's what I'm saying about a course has a topic, but there are deeper things. Another deeper thing is the experience of understanding that if you learn a discipline, from that, you can learn other disciplines. I mean, I could teach voice leading, and, and there are these incredibly 
you know, these arcane voice leading rules that all the students have to learn, and we get good at them. But it almost, I mean, we could, we could learn chess instead, frankly, because it's like, you know, if they, there's, there's a whole bunch of other rules of music theory that we don't have time for, right? I mean, there's an infinite, near infinite number of things that we're not covering, and I want the student to come away with the experience of, I can master something, something hard, something detailed, something that's outside my immediate intuition and that they can start, they can, they can learn that. And so I, I, it's more important to me that music theory is a platform from which students can have a kind of intellectual courage um, and so forth. All right, another thing that I do as I believe in what I, I guess I'll call the holy trinity of critical thinking, writing, and speaking. And one of the things that I, 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 I guess we all do, right? But one of the things that I've noticed is that people, they, they say, oh, well, this is a this kind of class, so we're, there's actually no speaking in it. Or this is a this kind of class, so we don't have to have a writing assignment. And that's something that I really actively try to, to avoid. So for example, like in music theory, where you're doing all these tonal harmony exercises every week, most, you know, uh, many people in the theory curriculum don't actually assign uh, a, a kind of academic, rigorous, scholarly paper, research paper. But I, I do. I do a project in that. You know, it's a short five-page paper. But that's actually part of my theory curriculum. In Rock, Sex, and Rebellion, where you have 200 students in the classroom, you'd be initially inclined to say, well, that's too big for a discussion. And, um, and it's actually not. It's hard, but it's not. But more important, it's too big for, some, for 200 students to give, you know, oral presentations to the class. It's not, and, and so what we've done, and my teaching assistants are, you know, they, they, they love me and hate me for this because uh, it's created a lot of work and logistical challenges, but we actually, every student gives a five minute timed, like, uh, like as if it's a radio broadcast, carefully articulated practice presentation, and we collect a top hundred list of songs, the greatest rock songs of all time, and we break out into 10, over a course of one week, 10 two-hour sessions, and everyone has to attend one of them. So you're attending one two-hour session. The TAs, see, they have to attend all of them. <laughs> but you attend one two-hour session, and you hear 20 presentations, and you're one of them, and you have this experience. And by the way, that presentation, uh, along the lines of this, this sort of deeper, uh, uh, going back to my first point of leveraging some sort of deeper issue or understanding, the presentations, by the way, are not, they're half an, an analysis of the actual song that's been selected. The other half is an analysis or an explication of the values on the basis of which the choice was made. So I'm equally interested in why, how, on, you know, what kinds of um, things that they're concerned about. For, and, 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 and so we're collecting not only 200 top, top songs, we're collecting 200 reasons for why you would have, choose, how you would choose a top song. Okay. Um, Casual atmosphere. I like to try to create a casual atmosphere, and um, and in class, but also out of class. And this actually goes to the idea that I, I really try to get students. I, I I don't know if I if I succeed always, but I really try to get students to take responsibility for their own education. I always say that that I never that I didn't get a good education. You don't get a good education. I didn't get a good education at Carleton College for my, as an undergraduate. I took a good education. It was as much my responsibility as it was the institutions. And I try to remind students that it's, it's a, they have to, I mean, it's not just a question of like applying yourself. You have to really go and get it. And what you learn from that is that you can get it and you can continue getting it. I mean, four years to me, frankly, it's a good number. It's arbitrary. A master's is this many years, a doctorate, well, that's already kind of a weird, flexible sort of thing. But, the, but four years is for a baccalaureate, baccalaureate has certain charms, but it ultimately is, is, um, is kind of arbitrary. I mean, we're students for life. And so the idea is to explain to my students that in a, music, in a musicianship uh, sec session, they have these breakout groups with their teaching assistants, and they work on uh, dictation and, vo and, 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 and ear training and rhythm reading and sight singing. And they do these things for like their 50-minute time period, but they're not going to get really good at it. Um, unless they do it outside that. So I try to encourage students to, to, you know, to use the time in the shower to practice singing your scales or get together with other people. Maybe not get together people in the shower. That might be two different times. But, you know, of course, you know, students are, are creative and, um, you know, interesting people. Um, the, the, um, but the, 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 the point is that these students, you know, they really need to continue to try um, to, to to, to learn outside of the boundary. The, the, there's only so much that they can learn within the infrastructure of, of the curriculum, and that they have to go beyond that. One of the things that I, I started to do was to, to give that sense that things go outside the classroom is I started something called Composer Club, 
which, is, which started as a three-week rotation where the first week would be an independent study lesson with me, an individual lesson with me, which is the kind of traditional model for as a, a composition mentor. The second week is a roundtable discussion with everybody giving a 10-minute report on, their prog on their, the progress of their current composition, and everybody else commenting back and, and offering advice, because you, we, learn to, we learn things by becoming te I mean, I, I, I'm my composers become composers, good composers by becoming teachers of composition to themselves. And you can first model that by, by having some distance and, and, and making a comment to, to a colleague. Um, and then the third week was a potluck dinner party at my house. And of course, you know, this suits me, uh, this, this, my lifestyle, this doesn't necessarily suit everybody. You could, but it doesn't have to be your house. It could be, you know, a cafe on campus or something. But the idea is that we were going to make this kind of casual, you know, fun time where, and we have guest speakers and I bring things in and so forth. But there's this kind of like light dinner party. And, and, and that's the idea that I wanted to convey that you, you can keep learning in, in, in spaces and places and, and, you know, that don't look like a, a kind of traditional academic environment. Um, another sense of community that I wanted to that gather was in the Music Concrete course, which created this extraordinary community where it was really one of the hardest courses. Uh, it's probably the most rigorous course that I've taught, in, or the most demanding. And the students, I think, who were in it, and there's, I'm, there's one here who I think, you, you know, I'll, I'll put you in touch with him afterwards. You can ask him. But it really, I, I've heard that it was like the most demanding course they've ever taken at Stanford. And, part, and the reason it was demanding is because I set the bar, bar very high. And there were all sorts of things they had to do. But it was also high because there were these weekly assignments that were, that, that were concise, constrained assignments that built skills and built confidence, but then escalated. But every week, people would hear what everyone else did, what everyone else did in, the, in, in, their, in their little in their etude. And it became a kind of, not competitive in a pejorative sense, but it became a, like, I'm, I'm going to be on display. I've got to show what I'm going to do. And there was this, this sense of like this community really trying to learn from each other and show each other what they were going to do. And we also had um, these slice and dice concerts that were on the concert calendar from before the, 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 the term started. So everyone knew they were working to a public presentation, which is also another a nice thing that motivates people. But there was, a, there was this incredible sense among those students of, look what we bring to the table collectively. This is really cool. And when you get that going, you can almost step aside and you can let this, that's what we want ultimately, right? We would like to be able to step aside and let the students just have this buzz and this kind of perpetual motion. Um, the public presentation of final projects, I'll segue into that, is something I also believe in. Um, and I'll, I'll reference one other thing, uh, which was in the John Cage seminar. We had a, this fantastic, uh, I timed that specifically because I was on a, a group with Lively Arts that was working on bringing the Merce Cunningham Dance Company to campus last term. Some of you may remember their residency. And so we did a, we pl I planned the course to happen in that quarter with the Cunningham Company at the tail end of the quarter and with a collaboration where the 16 students in the Cage Seminar performed the music for the Merce Cunningham Dance Company in an event on White Plaza that hundreds of people came to. And there was just such an exciting buzz about the, the project nature of the course, that we were having this you know, scholarly kinds of discussions in class, and that, but we were also getting ready in a kind of laboratory setting for this big public performance. Um, that, by the way, I mean, that, that's actually like historic. There will, be, there will be books that write about every specific collaboration that the Merce Cunningham Dance Company has done in their history. I mean, the, and, and, the, and these students are part of that history. I mean, there's something kind of exciting about that. And some of you know about that when you invite your students to take part in your research and, and so forth. And they get to you know, piggyback on that. And they suddenly take this kind of ownership of the work it, it, to a new level. Um, Another thing that I did in the CAGE class were a kind of set of mini lectures where everybody learned from each other. So I had this, this orbiting constellation of topics, and, I, and each student was assigned one. And because actually CAGE was interested in chance procedures in his music, we rolled dice to determine the order of who would present what and which the order of the topics, which was kind of a fun thing. But it was actually a... Um, I found that to be actually a way, uh, uh, just an efficient way of having people go out, students go out, do a lot of research on one thing, come back and pr distill that, and then present that. And so obviously they have the task of distilling all the information, which is a great thing to do educationally, but also instead of having everybody research 16 things, which would be well beyond the scope of the, you know, of the demands of, of a 10-week course, you know, we got the benefit of the, the, the final bits of these things. Um, Another thing that I'll say is just a kind of philosophic thing that I do and I think I should do is I try as a mentor, particularly of individual composers, 
I try, I always think about balancing, I have this meter in the back of my head, about balancing high levels of self-confidence and self-criticism. And you have to have both in balance and a lot of each. And so what my, one of the first things that I try to do as a teacher is I try to assess what, which of these things does the student need. And then you get, that, you get them into balance and then you can challenge them and so forth. Um, the icebreaker is something that I like to do. And I was asked by the Stanford report or the Stanford magazine about, uh, for an article on icebreakers that I think is forthcoming. And so I wrote this. So now I'm going to just read this to you because it's here. The so-called icebreaker is one moment at the beginning of the academic quarter when a tone can be set. For me, this is largely about hearing from every student, giving them some familiarity with the act of verbal expression in front of the group. This is particularly important in freshman seminars during the fall quarter. These students are completely new to Stanford. For many of them, their last academic experience was as valedictorian of their high school. Around a bunch of other valedictorians, they suddenly clam up, fear that they are imposters, and worried that their contribution to a conversation might be average. The icebreaker should serve as a get over yourself moment. My beginning music theory students know that the first day of class involves tasting and then analyzing the qualities of three contrasting foods. Food is a social lubricant in our culture, but in this case it also serves to make the point that the intrinsic goal is to understand a text, determining what are the best tools for its analysis, speculating on an author's intention, formulating a critique, and becoming self-aware of our biases and wisdoms. The text, when it is a piece of music, tends to get lost in the complex hazards of an extant theory of tonal harmony, whereas students seem to have no trouble formulating a theory for understanding and communicating about food. At the end of class, no one is hungry, everyone has contributed to the conversation, and we've had a lot of laughs together, and we've actually done some real theorizing, something which regrettably rarely happens in many music theory classes. In classes which, which, in which it is particularly appropriate to learn something about each student's background, I conduct an exercise in which students rapidly complete a sentence that reveals something autobiographical. Um, for example, I came to Stanford because a good roommate should, when I save enough money, I'm going to buy uh, a book that I highly recommend is, if I could learn two more languages, they would be, I'd love to have a backstage pass to, I'm happiest when, as a kid, I got in trouble when I, during an earthquake, I would probably, etc. Students generally find this to be a lighthearted and enjoyable way to hear from their colleagues on the first day of class, and some of the responses are extraordinarily unexpected, funny, alarming, witty, etc. I've even had students who are vexed, who were vexed about their response, offering revisions to the group during the next class session. <laughs> the most startling response was from a student who, when prompted, when I'm famous, my stage name will be immediately offered Rune Kincaid, <laughs> with such alacrity and certainty that it was clear he had given it a lot of prior thought. <laughs> so, um, and by the way, you can do that. You can do that quickly on a first day. I don't think you have to use up the whole first day on that kind of thing. But it, it sort of sets a nice tone. Finally, <coughs> I will say that, or maybe I'll do a couple more of these before I move on. Um, it's good to let students contribute to the curriculum through their own presentation on a topic that they actually choose. Now, I started to do this as a self-defense measure. Like, your course didn't cover, my favorite wasn't, you know, why don't, this, at, at this school they do, you know, and so that's my moan of like, the final symposium that we're going to have that's open to the public for, you know, or whatever, or in their class presentation, that's your time to choose the thing that you thought was missing. And, and this actually goes a long way to actually, you know, staving off certain kinds of criticism about the content. But also, it, it, it again invites the students to take initiative and take responsibility in the content of the course. Um, OK, I guess I'll say one more thing here that I like to do early on is I like to gain some sort of credibility or authority um, in the first or second class. I, I think I, I, one of the things I do is I admit vulnerabilities and insecurities and fallibilities and problems, but usually not on the first day. Like I like to first try to get some sort of authority. And so for me in music, because I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, somewhat skilled at the piano, in fact, I'll invite you all to a concert on Wednesday that I'm giving where I'm the featured artist with the Stanford Jazz Orchestra. It'll be Wednesday night, May 18th, which you can remember because 18 is between 17 and 19. <laughs> um, at 8 p.m. in the Dinkelspiel Auditorium. Um, and anyway, but I, because I have this technique a, 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 as a pianist, I, I like to dazzle them a little bit on the first day. You all have your sort of special thing that you can do. It may, may or may not be piano like organic chemistry classes, the piano is you know, less familiar. 
less frequent, but you know, but it might, you never know. So figure out what is your thing. I, I recommend doing this. And another thing that, that comes up that, that, that's kind of nice is in a discussion of consonance and dissonance on a first day of a music theory class as emotional states of, of you know, a kind of restful state that doesn't, is not in need of resolution versus one that has some sort of kind of sense of anxiety and we think, and is in need of resolution. We think of that typically in pitch, but I remind them that it also exists in rhythm where, you know, one against one would be a rather consonant state and two against one is still pretty constant, but we could say on a, on a continuum it's slightly more dissonant and three against two is slightly more dissonant than that and four against three it comes together every four and five against three uh, and seven against four say <laughs> it's like a it's like a parlor trick or something for me, but it's like, but people are like, you know, and then you hit them with, now what if we put this in an ocular dimension rather than an aural one? So if we take the conducting pattern for five, say one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, and then three against that one. <laughs> and you do this, and then you continue to give a lecture at the same time, and people are just like, you know, like, um, okay, I'm not going to challenge his authority just yet or something. And so it's like, um, all right, let's move on to the next um, topic, things I don't do and shouldn't do. I don't tailor my curriculum exclusively to some ladder model where it's like, oh, this is music 21. I have to prepare for music 22. You know, I mean, and there's a lot of pressures to do that because my senior colleagues who teach 22, I mean, that's going to be a problem if I don't prepare them for that. But I really try to resist the temptation that we're simply teaching a bunch of skills so that the students can go on to the next skills. You have to really, I mean, there has to be a reason for all of these things intrinsically that can't only be about, like, getting ready for some next thing. Uh, mathematics was taught that way to me, and I hated math because of that. And I think there's, it, I, I'm sure there's, I mean, there's definitely joy and, I mean, a, a different kind of, a whole other world about math that I, I haven't been exposed to. I don't know that I have the time or courage to go back and find it myself, but, um, but I know it's there, and I've heard about it being there for people. Um, another thing that I try not to uh, tailor myself to is thinking about the, preparing for the GRE. Okay, and, and I specifically resist the idea of thinking about our peer institutions. Um, they, they, they might have it wrong. In fact, in music theory, they do. They do all have it wrong, and, and, and um, as do most universities. I, I, I hate the way music theory is, is taught, actually, in, 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 in anywhere, actually. And I alone know the right way to do it. Um, <laughs> but. The thing is, I mean, why not consider how it's done at a community college? Why not consider something that's a model from a junior high? Why not consider some non-Western model like the, in, in music, the, the guru-shisha relationship in, in, in Hindustani raga, for example, in India, which is a different model than a conservatory kind of model. There's all sorts of models, and they might come from weird places. Um, and, they, you know, and so I think we should consider that in terms of like how to teach it as well as what the content really should be. Um, another thing that I don't do and I think I shouldn't do is I don't pretend the teaching is unbiased or objective. And so I admit that I have biases on the first day of class and I, I, I alert the students to that and I, and I say that this is okay. I mean, this is what you want. You want a kind of, I, I'd say that I attempt, I aspire to be objective, but I have my own ax to grind and I have my own, you know, sort of, in, you know, inclinations and leanings and my own agenda. and. Uh, and so in a sense, the next 10 weeks are going to be, I'm going to try to teach this course as if it's some sort of objective subject, but it's going to be an editorial. And that's what you're taking, and all of your classes are like that, and that's fine. What you want is you want, you're taking this class because you're getting my editorial for 10 weeks, during which you can be critical of it and think about that, but and especially after which, you know, you can choose to keep thinking about it or not. It's just that during that term, you're just going, it's the gospel according to me for those 10 weeks. Um, I also... Don't, one of the other things that I don't do and shouldn't do is I don't forget that I am weakest as a teacher of that which comes easily to me. And I don't assume that because it's easy for me, it's easy for the other students. This is something we really forget, that when we have a, when things that came very easy to us, we're usually the worst at, we're usually the worst at teaching. And those things that we, where we struggled and we had to, you know, we, we, we can, we are better at anticipating what the problem areas will be for students. And I think we're more effective teachers often. These are not things that we struggle at necessarily currently. These are things that we're, we, we, had, we had problems with at some point. Um, I, also don't, I also do my best, and I almost never have had a pro, uh, um, broken this rule, um, I don't refer to students as kids. 
because I think I just don't think it's a good idea. I think they're young adults, and we we have these expectations from them, and I don't know. I think the whole kids thing it's charming, but it, I just feel it undermines the enterprise. Okay, back to something a little bit more pejorative: things I don't do but should do. Um, I have not solved that music theory curriculum thing. I do not have the guts in the with the huge weight of international, institutional, and historic, um, you know, this huge weight of uh, this attrition, as it were, of how music theory is taught. I have not, I have, I've taken small steps, partial steps, to do things to, to, to evolve the, the theory curriculum. But I really feel, I know to myself, that it needs a, a, a revolution, not an evolution. And as an untenured member of the faculty, I don't have the guts to undertake it at this, at this point. And also, I'm, I'm here as a professor of composition mostly, and I, I also teach theory. So I, I kind of, I end up excusing myself somehow from this undertaking. Uh, another thing that I, that I don't do, but I probably should do, is I should have more distance from me and to my teaching assistants. And I think it's good the way it's been now and the way it's been recently, but my, I'm, I'll, basically this is a criticism of my first year at Stanford, where I came in, I'm in my early 30s, I've got teaching assistants who are working for me, and for the class, and for me, um, who are my age, older, a little bit younger, who I respect who, in terms of what they know and the fact, and I, I respect that they know as much as me and that we know different things and the, some of the different things that they know are equally or more valuable than the things that I know. And I conveyed that to them, which I thought was a really good thing to do. And I also had this kind of whole cool with the kids kind of attitude and just being like, you know, super friendly and trying to not build up an artificial barrier. And I found that that, that barrier in moderation, it's a very hard recipe, it's a very hard formula to get, get appropriate, but that barrier in moderation is actually kind of important because they ran all over me and it was a really bad experience. And so suddenly, it was almost that anecdote at the beginning about the student who didn't understand expectations. Suddenly, when I was, when like they weren't grading the assignments on time or, or not at all, it was like, and then I wanted them to do that, it, they, it was whole sort of like, like I was suddenly became this uh, Jekyll and Hyde, like evil, um, evil bad cop sort of person, and and so and it was clear in my mind that like okay now we're being we're talking about the curriculum, we're being social after class, uh, we're hanging out. That's all the friendly things, and like you notice that I'm like serious and punctual about my lectures and preparing it and making it. So like I expect that from you too. But they thought that. There, some of their, they did fine jobs sometimes, but some of the things were in that, oh, he's friendly, he doesn't care, he won't care if, it's, if we don't grade this this week, if we grade it next week, and, you know, so that was something that I, ha that I learned the hard way, or I'm, and I'm still learning. Um, but that was the only, I will, I will say again that that was the only really problematic experience that I had in my, my current TAs are the best ever. You rock. I could say something about management style, but I think I just did. <laughs> so, um, another thing that was a bad experience that I did, I'll be self-critical about, was a time when I had a paper from a student. She was a, she was a first year student. And, um, and she wrote this paper, and it was pretty dreadful. It was um, the arguments were, didn't follow one from another. The paragraphs didn't build. The grammar was bad. There were awkward run-on sentences. It was, it, was, it, was, it was really a mess. And I mean, it was a passing grade paper, but it was just not a good paper. And I let her know in no uncertain terms. And what I learned from this experience, in which she then, which involved the Kleenex box from my bottom drawer of my desk during the uh, uh, subsequent office hour meeting, um, she was really unglued by this. She was, uh, she was really upset. And she was outraged that my criticism was not constructive. That's what she, that's what, that's what she said. And basically, I mean, I think. In honesty, she was mostly shocked because this was the first time that somebody had told her that her work was not, you know, up to snuff. And she and, and she was under the mistaken delusion that she was actually really a fine writer, which she was not. And and I had made like, I, you know, there is the, the 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 writing center and there is resources on campus for you to. And I suggested I had I had said those things in my comments, but she didn't really see that as like it wasn't constructive enough or it didn't equally balance the invective that, that I levied against her. And, and so what I've learned from that is that I can still get my message across in a little bit more gentler tones, OK? And, and, and particularly to be sensitive to first year students who, don't, who are just coming in and don't have necessarily a sense of what the standard you know, should be or what's expected. Um, 
Okay, now I want to turn to this poll that I promised you. Some, so what did the Rock Section Rebellion students say? And let's start again with things I do but shouldn't do. A lot of them say, I go on way too many tangents and I have too many digressions and anecdotes. And, um, and they're, they're right. But the, the problem with this criticism, <coughs> excuse me, the problem with this criticism is that on the same poll, an equal number of students said the tangents and anecdotes are so useful they, they're refreshing, they're fun, but they also have pedagogical value and they sort of underscore some weird thing. They get at the content in some, you know, strange, you know, sort of like oblique manner. And, you know, so one student is, is obtuse, another oblique, and you know, where is the balance? I wasn't exactly sure what to take from this, but I think I, it is true that I, that I, um, that I um, go on too many sort of tangents with, with like these kind of anecdotes. Another thing that, that, but it's in the same category, is sarcasm. You're too sarcastic, and like, um, and then, and then, and then the other students are like, "Oh, the sarcasm is great. That's one of your best teachings." So I'm not, I'm a little bit lost as to as to why if that's a good or bad thing. One thing that this, the students did tell me that I think is a bad thing, and I think they're right, is I do too much meta narrating of the course. I, there's too many moments, too many asides of like, kind of apologies why I didn't get to this why I couldn't include this, um, you know, why I don't have time for that, and that sort of thing. And I think that that's sort of, I think you can do that in moderation, but I do think that I do too much of it. And I think it's kind of under, you, you're sort of selling a product, you know, to a certain extent. I hate to think of it that way, but if we, if we want to think in those kinds of commercial terms, then um, you're, you're kind of like, un, un, you're, you're not, you're lessening the, your, your faith in the product, in a sense. Um, another thing that, that they criticized is that I give in to squeaky wheels in order to be diplomatic. Um, and a subset of that, which I don't know is actually a bad thing, is spending way too much try time trying not to offend someone, being overly or tediously careful and diplomatic. Um, but so this was like, I just, you know, there were some students who thought that the, you know, some of the quiz questions were too picky for the reading, and so I made an adjustment and, and as a kind of good faith effort. And I think, and I think this came from a, a student who was like, I did the reading really carefully, and it was a fair quiz, and I was ready for it. And so maybe I am being, you know, maybe I am being too you know, pushed around. Um, things that they like that I do are, are humor, apparently. Apparently I have humor. In my in my in my presentations, and the, and it's, it, it quote keeps us awake and enhances the amount of material that we can take in. I actually think of humor in the classroom as a kind of system, this weird metabolism of earning and owing. So I feel like okay, we've done this kind of rigorous, serious thing for like the last like 12 minutes. Now you've earned like some sort of jokey thing or an anecdote, and and so in a, in a sense for me, that's like part of just not packing the information in. It's sort of resetting in that regard. And the other thing that they like, they identified in the, that I kind of cluster here with humor is that something that I do and I should do. They said is what somebody refer, one student referred to as the reset moment, a joke or unexpected comment to re-energize everyone to quote bring bring them back. So, you know, you start losing people and you just do something just like totally unexpected or weird. Sometimes, it, for me, it will be a non sequitur, you know. L two years ago, I started lecturing one day in a tiara, just without any, re re you, know, you know, without any kind of, you know, you know, reference to it whatsoever. And there are other strange things that you can do that are just like, and people are, you know, that's just like a little wake-up moment, like, you know, um, you know, like just lay on the piano for the next three minutes without referring to it and then just del keep delivering your things and it's just like you know <laughs> another thing is I apparently convey that I love the material I really love the material and that makes it interesting to students that that my enthusiasm is infectious another thing they like is that I walk but I do not pace around <laughs> I'm not exactly the, the distinction I think is it's not entirely clear to me but apparently maybe I think I'm I'm ambulatory, but with some sort of purpose, as opposed to some regularity or something that, I don't know. Um, somebody says, I'm able to teach opinion, my own opinion, as well as fact, without arrogance or condescension. Notice I'm unable to give you a tip for how to do this, but I'm just, this is basically, I'm just patting myself on the back in front of you right now. Um, I admit vulnerabilities and insecurities. This is a student who said this is a good thing. Um, I invite feedback from students, and I adjust the course accordingly. But that might be in contradiction to the giving into squeaky wheels. I'm not sure. Um, here's something that somebody says I do. I read the audience well. I know when to change modes when I'm losing them. So for example, I'll, I'll suddenly, I'll spontaneously put on a video or play an excerpt from a piece of music or get them to do something. I'll have them stand up and conduct or anything when it's a moment where I feel like I'm losing them. 
Um, I use abundant musical examples, both recorded and demonstrated on the piano. Um, I candidly discuss potentially offensive words or phrases, which demonstrates a sensitivity and awareness. And I, and I think I, and I describe those, and I, and I discuss those with um, great awkwardness, but self-referencing awkwardness. And I think they appreciate that. Um, I'm spontaneous, apparently, in lecture. I don't give canned lectures. They like that. They like that um, there's hands-on applied learning. For example, one day in class, we composed a song. I brought in an entire digital editing kind of setup, drums, electric guitars, keyboards, and I put it up on the huge projection screen so everyone could see that. And we actually composed and recorded an entire rock song right there. And that was a revelation to people. So th those kinds of practical things where people do, do that together. Um, I use familiar music first to solidify an understanding, and then I branch out to the unfamiliar. So starting with the familiar and moving out. But I mean, that's like a technique that I, I'm conscious of doing. I think it's what's fascinating is that a student picked up on that and said that was valuable. Um, oh, here's something I'm actually quite proud of, I have to confess. I unpack student comments in a way that validates each contribution and makes each contribution useful. And this is something I, I had role models for. Um, uh, particularly Steve Schick, who I was a teaching assistant for at the University of California, San Diego. He was just amazing. Somebody could give the most off-the-wall thing. And he said, you know, your comment uses the article the. And we can use the also to, I mean, it could be like this completely, you know, you know, I mean, just kind of amazing. Like, you know, is it a, is it a, are there multiple things or just a single thing? In a single? Well, it's like single, but one more would be multiple. I mean, it's just like, you know, he had this incredible ability and stuff, and I just really love to do that kind of thing, you know. And finally, one of the things that the students recommend is what I referred, what I actually referred, this is my term, martyr pedagogy. And <coughs> martyr pedagogy is usually followed by you do something, and then it could be easily followed by the, the, uh, the, 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 the comment, I look stupid you'll always remember, okay? So that's, that's kind of the, ar the architecture of, market, of, of uh, martyr pedagogy. Things that, they, things that I don't do, according to the students, and shouldn't do, they say that um, I don't pander to students who are not willing to undertake academic rigor. I set high expectations. Another thing that they say I don't do and shouldn't do is teach the book. They, they, some students say, that, you know, if you taught the book, I wouldn't come to class. I, the, the, the book is a, is a kind of a, a, a corollary. It's useful. I want to hear your own ideas that sometimes weave, them, weave their way through the book, but are, often are separate. Um, they also say that I don't do excessive gratuitous PowerPoint. And I'll refer you to, and I, 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 I use PowerPoint very much in limitation, and I use it very carefully, and never, or almost never, in a sequence, and never with the bullet points of, you know. Um, and I refer you to um, Edward Tufte's The Cognitive Style of PowerPoint, which is a great polemic about PowerPoint. Um, I don't patronize or talk down to the students, apparently. I think I do sometimes, but they don't. That's, so that's good. I'll just I'll <laughs> keep, I'll keep that spin. Uh, they say I don't speak too quietly in a monotone or stationary. For example, one student said, you don't stand behind a lectern. Actually, the student said podium. I have a personal thing about the difference between podi the podium and the lectern. It's a pet peeve. It's a lectern. I don't, I'm not standing on it. Um, OK. Um, I, and the other thing I don't do is read long quotes or passages of text verbatim. Did I start to lose you during the icebreaker? The icebreaker was OK. The icebreaker was OK only because I think it was counterbalanced with hu humor. Because if it wasn't, I think that length of a quote might have, might have lost you. Things they say that I don't do but should do, and I'm about to be guilty of this one, end on time. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm notorious about going over. I, I, sometimes a good day is, is I'm over a minute or two minutes, but it's all, it starts stretching to five or ten minutes. And it's a particular problem in this class because I know it ends at 11.50, and I know that almost no students have a class at noon because it's, it's sort of lunchtime. That's not true of all of them. They have appointments. They have lives. I shouldn't take that for... But I've, I, and I think that suffers from the standard sort of like, I'm a professor. My students take my class, and only my class. That's all that's going on in their lives. They're dedicated to this, and only this, right? Um, another thing that some students like that I don't do is give an outline at the beginning of class. I do give an outline, but I think they'd like a, more, a little bit more detailed outline. And also, um, in a two-hour class, they would like a stretch break, which I have now implemented, in the middle of classes. Um, 
So those are some things about, so that's the end of my list. But I, I promised you no conclusion and I lied. So I'm going to have, I will conclude with, I guess, a kind of a philosophical statement, which is, a, um, which is, it's not a conclusion to this. It's actually just now a philosophical statement. Okay. Um, I remain idealistic that I can make the world a better place through teaching. And I, I think a lot of people actually think that that's just BS. But I really, I, I do, I can't help it. Um, to be specific, I see all of my courses as opportunities for students to first develop an appetite for intellectual curiosity, to acquire the courage to confront different opinions, to broaden their understanding and appreciation of different people and ideas. Second, I see all my courses as opportunities for students to co ask complex questions about quality, to create a personal set of values from which to evaluate, criticize, and judge music, to identify personal assumptions and recognize the differences between this set of values and other sets. Third, I see all my courses as opportunities for students to comprehend the cultural, artistic, and political significance of music as an instrument for marginal groups and for the mainstream. And lastly, I see all my courses as opportunities for students to believe in their agency and in the significance of their actions, to feel a sense of ownership of and responsibility to their community, to become aware of their own role in the evolution of culture. Thank you. I'm happy to ask questions. I don't know if we have to wrap up. Uh, I'm happy to answer. I can ask questions too. <laughs> or do we need to? Do we have five we minutes? Have or? Just the end. Five minutes. Okay. So I start with the comments. I think one thing you should not do, but you do, is talking that fast for 60 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know from music there's forte, there's even fortissimo, but there's undone. <laughs> My question, the last point of your I do and I shouldn't do was about performance. Here I somehow disagree, I feel that, and I would like to hear more about it. why not performance. Look, one thing we have to do is prepare, preparation, that's it, I heard here a few years ago. So a performance is what we do. What against performance? I thank you for your comments, and and I agree with you. Andante is nice. Um, Andante is good. Although I think I, I, I wouldn't uh, naturally I wouldn't take your ex your example literally, which in in a kind of symphonic form in which you would have one long movement of Andante followed by a you know like this presto, and that would be completely incomprehensible, incomprehensible. But of course, you know. The scherzo in the symphonic form is the Italian word for joke, and so that's the humor part. So maybe you could have a movement of that. But um, let me let me move on to I think the the other comment that you make, which is important. I, I actually, I'm in complete agreement with you as you define performance and as you think about performance, and um, and and actually we can give unprepared performances as well. But I agree that there's some there's great value in the prepared performance. My concern is that I know that is a very personal one. And it's definitely part of a personal confessional, which is I, there's a certain part of my ego that is bound up in performing, and I know that as a musician. And I get a certain kind of buzz from the audience when I give a musical performance. And I fear that I sometimes might be designing my performances as an educator to look for that buzz in a, that, that, sat, that satisfies my ego in a way that, that uh, Whereas I should put that last on the list or farther down the list as a goal, and 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 that shouldn't in any way. I fear that it, it that it could possibly be on a subconscious level be competing with other goals that the performance should should do. Does that does that clarify things? Thank you. Yeah, I think we're in agreement probably. Other questions? Thank you. <laughs> The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.